everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of last best hope or conversation your babylon 5 podcast and we i'm going to start out with an apology last week when we were recording i was using a different computer in a different area <laughs> and we missed all the feedback for atonement i just want to apologize right up front yes we did get your emails <laughs> And no, you didn't send it to the wrong email address. I apologize. When we get to feedback, we're going to play it by ear and figure it out. But we got three emails from Atonement, three emails from Racing Mars. And I don't know if we're going to do a totally separate episode where we just read the emails. But we are at least want to acknowledge that right up front. I am your very apologetic, one of your hosts, Jesse Jackson. Joining me, as always, is Lou. Hello, everyone. And Karen. Hello. And today we are talking Racing Mars, originally aired April 21st, 1997. And I want to start with Lou because Garibaldi's in this episode, though I'm not sure if you're going to be happy with the storyline. What do you think of the episode, Lou? Well, I'm glad to have him back, that's for sure. And I'm intrigued by the storyline, but the problems I have with it are not with Garibaldi. Okay. Very nice. And Karen? Okay. One thing I want to say about that storyline, I'm not going to get into it too much, but I was for sure something else was happening in it. And I still wonder if there's some part of it happening. Okay. That sounds intriguing. I look forward to hearing more of that. Okay. So we start out with, as we had talked about last time, during a long road trip, you will resort to I Spy, and I did the boxes, more boxes, even more boxes. Was funny. So, Karen, you got so you got two good looking guys traveling. What's your thoughts on? And they get to be a couple, which we did not expect. Oh my god! Yeah, so, so funny. Me, yeah, talk uh, to me about that up. Yeah, Captain Jack, I I think that he was doing it on purpose to be honest yeah because what would you do if you were getting new identities for two guys and they were like i could give you the married couple you would jump on that right yeah hell yes i'll take that one let's see where that goes yeah and i think it's it's pretty funny that happened and the fact that Marcus is just leaning into not Marcus. Yeah, Marcus is leaning into it. And Franklin is, oh my God, I I don't want this. And even when they were on like the people mover thing or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh Marcus is laughing. Uh okay. Franklin <laughs> is laughing with them at that yeah. point. And I, I loved the joke. I thought it was funny. You're, they were cute together with their arm in arm walking around. Um, yeah. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall when they filmed that. Yeah. And I, Luke spoiled the ice by, although that's not a big deal. I'm not complaining. Yeah. But then Marcus saying, first of all, it was like stars was one of them, yeah. right? And then he says boxes, more boxes, even more boxes. Franklin is at the point where he just wants to strangle. Marcus, right? It's very funny. I, I would love to see a buddy movie with those two. I, I know we can't, but I think that would have been funny. Yeah, I love the idea of this. And that's your honor when I killed him. Right? right? <laughs> yeah, that was uh, funny. That was very funny. Yeah. Lou, how about you? What What are you thinking of our couple? Yeah, I thought that was a funny bit. And given the background of the two characters, they pretty well reacted the way I thought they were going to. Marcus always jumps head first into every situation with a lot of gusto. Franklin's a lot more grumpy uh, about change and, and whatnot. I, I thought that was well played. I, I had to laugh when the guy was called Captain Jack because my mind immediately went to, to Johnny Depp and the Pirate of the Caribbean movies. But <laughs> this obviously predates that. I actually like the uh, 
the, the running gag with the Insta Heat meals with the smoke coming mm -hmm. out of the pouch. I thought yes. that was I thought that was really funny, and Franklin's reaction to it was great as well. Yeah, so there was a lot of good stuff in the, in those sequences with the two of them, even though. I still don't know why Franklin was sent instead of a, a lower medical person, but right. that's that's weird. Because uh, yeah. he's one of the main cast. Yeah. 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 So you have to just roll with it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly. From a logistical why. point of view, I don't right. understand it, but I agree. From a story of series perspective, I do. I did think Captain Jack was funny. And I think this is not spoilery, right? But. The thing on Jack's side, I'm going to call it Chekhov's parasite <laughs> because, yeah, symbiote, <laughs> because I think this will, I know this will come back again. Sure. Um, yeah. I'm assuming it's the same thing that is on the Centauri. Exactly. People. Yes. Yeah. And I thought that was interesting. Let's talk, and, and you guys just, in a lot of ways, there's not a lot of story with them being in Mars. We meet. Uh, number one, we meet number two, we talk about everything. So I was very sad that they did show in a little hints of that Jack was trying to tell them something. And on a second watch, they come out even more relevant and more shown. Lou, any thoughts on this whole Mars storyline? Because it, I guess it moves the story ahead. But a lot of it is it just sets them up there in Mars and they're working on doing these things. And we now have this symbiote. Yeah, the symbiote probably was the most interesting aspect of that the whole section of the episode. Though I did the code word that they used to recognize each other, but Lita had a little Vorlon. Her skin is pale as snow and everywhere the Vor that Lita went, the Vorlon was sure to go. I thought that was pretty funny too, and we, that wasn't mentioned, so I just wanted to get that in. Yeah, the the whole Mars thing was just more character stuff than really story progression, and that, but that's a luxury that you have with TV series that you don't have in a movie. That type of section in a movie wouldn't work, or in this episode wouldn't work in a movie, but in the TV series, you're more tolerant of that kind of stuff. I had to admit, though, that when the lead rebel leader showed up and she was like this model, I was going like, "What? Who's this? I'm just an old." old footy that he had her sexual male, but I was a little off put by that, to be honest. She just didn't look the part at all. She was just too pretty. So that was weird as well. Yeah. And I, she looked familiar to me and I checked and she's not done. She is, she's done a fair amount of things, but there wasn't anything that made me stand out like, oh mm -hmm. yeah, that's where I know her from. Yeah. Um, nothing that made me think oh i recognize her from that i'm right. sure i've seen her in other things but yeah and the fact uh, that she was called number one was funny too yeah, yeah. it was yeah um because they're going back to the original star trek pilot with major yeah. yep. barrett roddenberry yeah she did a couple episodes of quantum leap the original she was in regarding henry the harrison uh ford, ford movie, movie. Right. Uh, I, I wonder if she was the girlfriend that he had on the side before his injury. I can't remember. I so, can't yeah. either. Yeah, it's I, been um, forever since I watched that. Though, yeah. So. so yeah, I thought that was good, and I do agree. I loved the them eating those dry bars, which we've all done that, right? Yep. Having these. Oh no, it's delicious, and then it's not delicious. <laughs> it's just cardboard, and this guy. And I love Franklin because. I thought back to when Garibaldi had him over for dinner with his special birthday mm -hmm. and him going, this is great. Steven seems to be someone who enjoys good food. Yeah. And so that was a nice moment. He really wanted to eat those Insta meals or whatever. He yeah, really he wanted to. Yeah. I, so I believe he did. My thought is that she, oh, she's six feet tall. She looks like Olivia Diabo to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I've seen her in a million things, and she never ages, by the way, because mm -hmm. she was in like an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie way, way back, and she still looks the same. But anyway, that's what I thought I recognized yeah. her from. Her last name is Monahan, so mm -hmm. I'm wondering if she's, I, I can't find that she's related to anybody, but there are quite a few actors with that last name as well. Yeah. But anyway, I that storyline, I... There's a lot of implications. And again, I say this almost every episode, but I feel like there's a lot of stuff implied 
that advances the story. Like, why were they undermined? Why is this thing undermining them? Why are they being told that someone's coming to assassinate them? So there's something going on there, whether they're yeah. EarthGov people infiltrating or sure. I don't know. So there's that aspect to it. The fact that they are now on Mars, that ad- clearly advances that storyline. And then we get this rebel group. They're actually interacting with the people that they were sent there to interact with. And it did move quite a bit. If you think about each little part of it, it feels like it didn't. And Captain Jack gave me, and in the best possible way, gave me whiplash. Because he's, I'm your enemy. I'm your friend. I'm your enemy. I'm your friend. I'm your enemy. And it turns out that he... He wasn't really their enemy. He was trying to alert them to the fact that someone was coercing him. Something was yeah. coercing him. And that he was going to kill himself. Make sure my daughter knows, essentially, is what he was saying. Yeah. And I found that storyline interesting, yet still frustrating that I feel like it could have gone a little bit more. But yeah. I, I think that they did a bit with it they advanced it quite a bit just not as much as i would have liked maybe they got down to the planet and met with someone at the end of the episode it would have been nice for them to do a little bit more but i'm okay with how far they took it yeah and we do get at the end you wonder if marcus was trying to do a little matchmaking by going y'all go to dinner yep uh, uh, I, i'm 100 percent sure that's what he was doing yeah And I thought it was nice, the whole, they have the honeymoon suite. Yeah. Uh, So that was a kind of fun little joke. All right. So I'm going to save Garibaldi to the end. We have yet another ritual from the Mabari. And I got to say, I love John's frustration of no more. I was thinking, we talked about this last time, how everything is different. I love that the series tries to show a little bit that if you were trying to combine two cultures, not even just two Earth cultures, but actual two different planet cultures, that there's going to be bumps in the road. I also love, I want to hear your thoughts on Susan saying, yep, I never give up when I know I'm right. You need to take a day off. And of course, John's bored, like, what do I do? Because all the channels are blocked. He finally sees Garibaldi. I get the feeling he had not watched all of it before. He got to see Garibaldi. So let's stick with, they're finally going to get a chance to make, as they used to say on the Newlywed game, Whoopi. And that John is in favor of. But having an audience is something that he is not so sure about. Karen... As our resident romance specialist, (laughs) thoughts on this twist? Yeah. First of all, she says 47 before she says 50. And I'm not talking about the current meaning of 47, which is lame, but it was used in the original Star Trek and in Star Trek The Next Generation. It's a go-to, a touchstone Easter egg kind of number. And I thought it was cute i don't know if that was a nod to star trek but 47 was a pretty significant number to them i don't remember the reason but it was and for them to have 50 things to have to go through yeah john is not into that and i like how he just was completely against it until she said that they were going to get to know each other with their pleasure centers And then he was all in. He jumps up and and runs after her. Okay, let's do this. Let's go. This one is one I can get behind. Until he sees like the lurkers in his room or her room or their room. I don't know what it is, but they're all standing there in a corner, all creepy. Could have looked a little different than just people lurking around. But yeah, what did she think was going to happen? She's got to know enough about humans that she was aware that he would probably push back, right? Yeah, yes. that's, that's a kink I'm not into. Yeah. <laughs> um, so absolutely. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. Lou, how about you? I'm with Sheridan on this storyline. I think the, the first couple of times it was okay, but now it's getting a little tedious. 
Though yeah. I did appreciate the uh, his reaction to when there was like the audience of uh, all those Minbari in the in the room. I uh, I thought that was pretty funny. But yeah, I'm done with this all these uh, Minbari rituals and let's just get it on and let's move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I thought the same thing, and I really I thought back that you can only play this card so many times to Lynn, right? This is really important to me as we do. Yeah, why doesn't he say, it's really important to me that we just get on with it? Yeah. You I know, just, you'd I, think he uh, could yeah. push back a little bit. I'm just waiting for him to jump in with an earth ritual that she has to observe. Right? right? Even you if know, it's, it's fake. His turn. Yeah, even yeah. if it's right. fake, exactly. Yep. But, and she said, just like the engagement ring, okay, let's compare... I give you a ring to wear. We have to listen. We have to our first time having uh, intimacy. We have an audience, even if they are on the other side of the room. Now, I do know there are societies that have that, right? Sure. Yeah. 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 But it does. I could see him wanting to. No, they're not doing it to prove that they've consummated the marriage. That which Mm -hmm. is what the ritual was for in the Middle Ages or whatever. which meant that they they were doing it to have children. Yeah. This is just people watching them yeah, for no discernible reason. And I'm totally with Lou that it's way too many. John <laughs> needs to assert himself at this point. I think he was on the verge of pushing back until she said, it's us learning to touch yeah. each other and all that stuff. He was all in at that point, but before that, he was not interested. Yeah, it's a comedy bit where, and I think the best example of this is where you're doing something that starts out as funny, and then it keeps going on, and then it loses its charm, and you keep going on, and then it goes on so long that it actually starts to become funny again, and I think this is best illustrated if you've ever watched the Austin Power movie where he's awoken from his uh, freeze, and he goes for a tinkle, and it Mm -hmm. starts, and it goes, okay, and then it keeps going on, and you're going okay, I think this is a little overdone. And then it keeps on going on still, and then you start to laugh again because it's going on so long. So I I have a feeling that these rituals are in that section of, okay, we get the joke, let's move on. But I'll have to see what they do with if this is the final one or are we going to see something more still? Yeah. And you mentioned him getting relieved of duty at the beginning of the episode. I love how Ivanova says, hold on, she says, in the last nine months, we had a war you died and you came back to life several times. Yeah, at least <laughs> once. And we all know how horrible that can be. And you might not get a chance to have a day off anytime soon again. So go. And I love how nonchalant she is about it. I really do like Susan. I wish she was in it a little bit more. She gets little bits and pieces, but we need to see. Like last week, it was just superfluous with her coming out of the yeah. The tube thing with her cane or whatever. Um, this one was great that she's taking over. She's making sure her captain has a personal health day and and hopefully maybe more. Take off a little bit more. And I actually think that I was waiting for her to say, and your dead wife shows up or there, there's right, all right. these things he could do. Like a whole list of things. Yeah. I just... I thought it was funny that she mentions the war. Okay, the war. And then you died and come back a couple of times. And yeah. you know, that's nothing new. Yeah. I did think that I loved her discussion with the smugglers. I, I thought that was really yeah. smart that mm-hmm. she's you won't make as much money as you used to make, but there's less risk. And, and I will make sure you make a profit. Right. right. Any thoughts on that scene, Lou? Any yeah, I, thoughts I, about Susan? Yeah, I, I thought she was very strong in this episode. And um, it's interesting that Karen mentioned the thing about uh, her reciting what happened to John in the past bit, because that also was a thread in the Mars scenes where nobody on Mars knew anything about what had happened uh, between Babylon 5 and the Vorlons and the the shadows and that and Marcus and Franklin were a little bit miffed that nobody had, had real knew that uh, the sacrifices that, that they had gone through. So I, I thought that was a nice little bit beat as well in those scenes. And yes, Susan's uh, been strong and it's, 
I'm not nearly as hard as the shippers Karen, but I, I do wish there was more scenes between her and Marcus because mm -hmm. that's the only time that she seems totally oblivious to what's going on. Whereas with everything else, she's quite on top of things. Yeah, yeah. she seems out of sorts around Marcus a little, yeah. and a little vulnerable because he sees her. Yeah. He and does. I don't mean sees her with his eyes. He sees. Yeah. And that's always disconcerting. Yeah. I did want to go back to, uh, I do feel like Lanier broke a cardinal rule by mentioning woohoo or whatever. Like it, mm -hmm. it feels like it should be, nothing should be said. The joke, we will never speak of this again. Right. It feels like there should be this, no, what happens in the ritual of staring at the bedroom stays in the ritual of staying in the bedroom. Right. But I, I, what happens yeah. in Chanfall stays in Chanfall. Yeah. And I do think it is mostly just because they wanted the comedy, right? See, yeah. And they played it. Both of them played it very well. Yeah. Uh, but it, it struck me the same way as you just said. I yeah. was like, come on. Yeah. Dude, you would never do that. Yeah. Yeah, so I do think that, and I was going to tell the story, one of the odd things in my in-laws' life is when we started dating, Linda and I, that their parents, by tradition, only had family their Christmas Eve. Any other day of the year, you're invited to their house, you do things, they would feed us, they would, uh, she would, my her mom would give me to-go plates to go. But on Christmas Eve, it was just family. So even after Linda and I had dating four years, I wasn't allowed to go to her house on Christmas Eve. Oh. So you can imagine the first Christmas after our marriage, I was like, F this. I am not going on Christmas Eve. No. Because they had snubbed you all this time. Yeah, no, I'm just not doing this. Screw this. And Linda, and this is, the reason I'm telling the story, she looked at me and I need you to do this. I love you. You need to let this go. I need you to go to dinner Christmas Eve and just let it go. And so I did. And even though they kept like, oh, wasn't it great? You're so good to be here. Aren't you so happy you're finally here? And I had to eat things. <laughs> now, Crow. Crow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. So even we have now been married 40 years and Mary... Linda's sister rolls her eyes, but every Christmas, Clay and I still bring it up. If there is someone in the house that doesn't know the story, either Clay <laughs> or I will tell the story. Good. And Mary's, oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, no. And also, because Linda brings up that the last year we were engaged, Linda said, hey, Clay and Mary are engaged. Jesse and I are married. Why don't we let them come over? And Mary is the one who said, no, I want last. I want one last Christmas of Justice family. So what was um, the point of that? I have no idea. That's a weird tradition. It, it is, is very it strange. Just, it was a very weird tradition. Did they yeah. have the same uh, thing on Thanksgiving? No, no. Just Christmas Eve. That's just weird. Christmas Eve. That's weird. Yeah. So weird. I think yeah. we all have some weird. story like that yeah. with our in-laws yeah. but that is yeah. very strange yeah and so that's why i felt a little bit did they just not want to give you a present no just <laughs> i think it was because their older uh, linda's older brother ralph dated robin for years and robin's family christmas eve was their big deal and then so she would always be at her family for Christmas Eve, and he was with his family for Christmas Eve. So it just got to be a tradition. That's how they did it. Yeah. So strange. Yeah. And like I said, and this is years ago, I said, if Chris was in high school and he met someone at the mall on Christmas Eve and said, oh, you don't have anything to do? Why don't you come to our house? Bring him over. Yeah. He would be like, yeah, yep. come on over. 100%. You know? Yeah. yeah, I had friends over, friends that didn't have family in the area. I would bring them yeah. over to my parent my parents' house for Thanksgiving. Yeah. And so, it was yeah. very weird because Linda's dad, in a lot of ways, was another father to me. He they I, and I and except that was their, for on Christmas Eve. Except on Christmas Eve. <laughs> yeah. So I remember once there was a hurricane uh, warning, and so we called and checked to see how they were, and they said, "Oh, we're fine. We've got we've got." 
a few other friends with us. We're all here. We're batting down the stores. We have candles. We've got everything. And so after we hung up the phone, Mary said, that's Ray and Margaret. They're always inviting people over. They're always taking care of people. Not always. And Chris said, unless it's Christmas Eve. Yep. It's Christmas Eve. Your ass is out on I, the street. I would be exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. And, and Mary did not think that was funny. So, Too bad. Yeah. She brought it on herself, right? <laughs> so anyway. Oh, that is you. an amazing story. I thank love that. Thank you guys for letting me go on my uh, tangent here. Did, did uh, they have butter in their pocket, though? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, right. that's from a conversation we had before yeah. this. Yeah. If, if you want to look it up on YouTube, butter in my pocket. Yeah, yeah that might be a post credit extra. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the, exactly. We might think of that, Lou. Uh, all right. But let's get to Garibaldi. Anything else we need to talk about? The Susan has made an agreement with the smugglers, which I think is a pretty good agreement, right? Yep. They're going to you bring in okay, legal do stuff we, we need. Should we say agreement? Or should we say coercion? Because she really <laughs> did not give them a choice, right? She was so good in that. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, they didn't yes. have any choice, which I think is fair. Yeah, she twisted their arm. She said, okay, here, I, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse, right? <laughs> so we've got that coming on. That's going to explain how we're going to get supplies and other things. Delenn and Sheridan have now at least taken the next step. While John is looking for something to do, he goes and talks to Michael and has a chip on his shoulder. I think he goes in there, hey, why are you talking bad about me? And telling him, I think John mishandled this everything from my perspective. I think he did everything wrong on this. And I understand Garibaldi's original thought. And then we end up seeing someone, John is becoming a Masonic figure, and Garibaldi is worried that you're, he's going to forget where he came from and actually hurt the cause. So he makes an agreement that he is going to work with people who are wanting to get rid of John. So, Lou, take it wherever you want on this whole Garibaldi story. Do, do you mind go. if I go first? Because okay, sure. Please. I have an intuition about this that I'm not okay. sure. I'm sorry, Lou, but I want to bring this up first because I want to hear your opinion on it. Okay. No, great. Is that all right? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so John goes to see him, and he is so over the top with his anger. And the first thing I thought of is, they are working together behind the scenes to do something. This They're putting on a show for people. Now, I don't think that because of what John says or what yeah Sheridan says to Delenn later on, he okay. seems puzzled by it all. But I think that maybe Garibaldi is doing something mm. different and he's just not telling John. Okay. So is that why he quit to do something under the radar? Is he going to pretend to work with this group in order to learn more about it but really honestly when people have a fight in public that's that over the top my first thought is they're putting on a show and there's something else is going on behind the scenes okay now lou you can sorry okay, okay. i like that theory but the only thing that undermines it for me is the fact that we know that he's been brainwashed somehow by the, the psycho. True. So true. I don't really, th and I, the show hasn't shown that level of complexity with its right. storyline. So I highly, I would have loved, I would love that to be the truth. But I, I forgot I just, about that. I, yeah. I think that it's what we're seeing is what we're getting. And I'm glad that everybody said the thing that really initially bugged me about the scene was how over the chop top John got with his anger, which is basically proving Garibaldi's point that he's got an yep. overinflated opinion of himself. So to me, that see that John's handling of that situation was so over the top that I'm going like, is he really bought? Is this, is he just using Garibaldi as a punching bag for all the frustration that he's been feeling for all the things that have been going on? So yeah, that his behavior during that sequence was so over the top that it was very off putting. And the thing that frustrates me about the series is that it really compartmentalizes certain characters. Like when John goes and tells Delin about what happened, and she just brushes it off. And I'm going, like, why is not Delin or 
Susan or somebody else going to talk to Garibaldi about, dude, what's going on with you? Like, why are you doing what you're doing? There's no, they're I'm purposely isolating Garibaldi from all the other characters, which in a show, I you can do but in real life if these like were real life characters there would be some there still would be interaction between them like they would bump into each other i know it's a big station in that and they don't probably don't cross the same circles very often than that but i'm just frustrated that there's not more subtlety to the or complexity to the relationships between garibaldi and the other characters in the show where franklin he's gone now but there should have been some interaction there after what they were went through and Susan and Garibaldi seem to have a, a pretty good working relationship, and he doesn't have an axe to grind with her. It just would be interesting for us to see a scene with him and her talking, like, dude, what's going on with you and Sheridan? Like, why, why are you shut down with him and whatnot? So there, there's a lot of things going on here. With that being said, though, and keeping the brainwashing in mind, I'm interested to see where this is going to take Garibaldi's storyline going forward and... I'm hoping that it's going to lead to some sort of showdown between him and Sheridan where they're maybe for some reason they're trapped together or uh, maybe they're in a stuck elevator. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Or they're in a jail cell together. Who knows? Waiting for the psych to interrogate him, Sheridan or something like that. But at least now Garibaldi's got an interesting storyline because he's mm -hmm. really been spinning his wheels since... God, I can't even think for how far back now is he. We're even going back into the third season, I think. But it, it's yeah, the, the last episode of the third season. Yeah, so it's highly overdue for Garibaldi to be involved in something meaty um, because he's been sidelined for so much of the series. So I'm, I'm interested to see where it goes. I just really didn't like this first scene. And as we get into the next scene, it highlights a point that I thought the show was really going to play up is Garibaldi's resurrection from the dead. Um, because when they had that woman come up to him and say, oh, oh please touch yeah. me, heal me kind of thing. I, I wish they had sprinkled that more through all the intervening episodes between the Zaha Doom episode and, and where we are now, because then that would have you played up the stakes even a bit more, proving Garibaldi's point that Sheridan's got a Messiah complex going on. Yeah, I, I, I just think in an, a series where you've got these serialized storytelling, that's the kind of stuff that you can do that you can't do in one-off episodes or in a movie as well. And I think it's a real big missed opportunity that they've isolated Garibaldi so much from the rest of the cast. Yeah, I agree. I forgot that he did have the brainwashing. I apologize about that. I still like my theory, not that it's going to happen, <laughs> but I thought it was an interesting theory to have. I think it it fits, right? This is this whole, okay, um, we need to do this in public so people can buy into that right. we're having problems. That's what I thought was going to happen, was going to shake out. Yeah. But here now with Lou bringing that up, did Garibaldi separate himself and quit his job because he knew that he had this brainwashing? Is he fighting it off? Yeah. And is he signing on with these people? Like the brainwashing is telling him to do it, but like the part that's fighting off is going like in find out more stuff about it i don't know i would like to think he's trying to fight it off because like they did it in a different way or whatever but man i wanted that to be the case so bad until sheridan talks to delin and says he doesn't understand i agree with lou i think that we should have seen that kind of hero worship even if it's just like people touching him as he walks by or something and him talking to them because it kind of came out of nowhere for me in this episode. When have we seen these people treating him like that except for right now? Yeah, I agree. And I'm also sitting there at this whole, the John goes back the second time. Okay, let's try to make this better. And mm -hmm. he gets it even worse. And yep. I, I don't feel in a lot of ways, I it it's, doesn't it feels like you should have a better relationship than this it seems like they should have a better understanding right yeah and but garibaldi whole, kind of threw that away yeah. with his interview and that interview changed a lot of things yeah and and, and then he punches him out yeah so yeah that's and, sure and didn't I had did, it coming <laughs> yeah yeah and then i did like that okay you got one but the next one and I would have liked for Garibaldi to go, come on, then bring it on. Let's go I outside. Yeah, let's yep. go. Um, I'd love y'all's theories. 
Karen has already given one that perhaps Garibaldi is working on the inside ultimately to help. What are your thoughts, Lou, about Garibaldi agreeing to help this um, anti, I assume they're on Clark's side. By the way, that actor who plays the lead bad guy was someone else who has, oh yeah, that guy. Yeah, same. Yeah, Mark Schneider. Mark Schneider, yeah. Yeah, and he he does look like he has been in tons of stuff. Uh, Yeah, he's been. I looked him up too. Yeah. And it's those LA Law, NYPD Blue, all those kind of things. So, yeah, yeah, like just one of those working actors that was in everything. Santa did a lot of soap opera, Santa Barbara. Dallas. Uh, Days of Our Lives. Yeah. Remington Steel. There's a good yeah. one. Knight yeah. Rider. Yeah. Oh, Matt Houston. Wow. There's a. <laughs> yeah. Blast from the past. Yeah, yeah. Big time. Yeah. All right. So what's your theory, Lou? I'm, I'm pretty sure the brainwashing was. <laughs> To undermine Sheridan's reputation, I think that's what it is, and plus keep tabs on Sheridan, or and send reports back. But I think this group that's approached him is a curveball that was not foreseen by the Psychor, but it's going. He's going to go along with it because, according to his brainwashing, it serves the same purpose. And then I think that situation is going to get out of control. And that Sheridan is probably going to be in some sort of mortal danger. And at that point, Garibaldi's going to f- confront his brainwashing. And that will be the pressure point that maybe allows him to overcome it. And because he'll end up saving Sheridan instead of allowing him to be killed or some, something like that. And that will be how he breaks free of his brainwashing. And then him and Sheridan will become good buddies again. And Garibaldi will be reinstated as the head of security. And we'll all live happily ever after. Okay. <laughs> all right. So Anything... go ahead. I'm, I'm yeah. going through the IMDb listing for the actors and stuff. And the guy who played Captain Jack, he's still a working actor. The last thing he did was in 2017. He's still alive. He was in the Olivia Newton-John video for Let's Get Physical, <laughs> which I think is interesting. He was in Popeye. Again, he was in Trapper John, Remington Steel. The Magical World of Disney, there's an interesting one, Knott's Landing. So he was also one of those. Oh, and Back to the Future 3 is one of his biggest. He played a deputy in that. Okay. And he plays Santa Claus quite a bit on the Hallmark Channel. Oh, there you go, so there's that. <laughs> yeah. There we go. That's where I know him from. <laughs> exactly. Right. So he's interesting. He was in Popeye. The actors that are in this, I think they did good with their parts quite well. Yeah. And they, again, they were all those kind of background actors, but they were in all that stuff from the mid to late 90s. So uh, it's interesting to see them. And they're those people that tickle your brain a little bit. Like, mm. I know I've seen them in something and- it's really cool to see that. And again, we get a little archival footage of that sleazeball reporter that was on yes. the ship. He wasn't new in this episode, but man, he played that role pretty well in this one. He, Jeff Griggs. Yeah, he really does, doesn't he? Yeah. Good. Anything else we need to talk about in this episode? I'm good. All right. All right, Karen, you got a rating? Yeah, I think I'm going to give it uh, seven and a half uh, shoulder slugs. Okay, Lou? Yeah, I'm I'm there uh, around that, uh, that that mark as well. I'd probably give it, yeah, seven and a half, I don't know, um, symbiotes. We're both doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But mine is different. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to go a little bit lower, just Ooh. seven, mm. seven out of ten, ready to eat. Meals ready Meals? to eat, MREs. Oh, uh, I should have done that yeah. smoking packets, damn it. That's yeah. what I should have done. <laughs> yeah, smoking packets, yes, absolutely. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, Lurker's Guide is crashed on me, so I could not look for the episode. Oh, no. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, when you click on the episode link, it's getting a... I'm oh, yeah, I noticed that last week. Yeah, we're getting a... You can uh, search for the episode search. Yeah. What's it called? Racing Mars? Yeah. I'll look it up real quick. Okay, here I got it. Why is it called Racing Mars? I don't get yeah, that. Yeah, I don't get it. Seven seven three. Okay, <laughs> so, 
that's Very their good, okay. rating. So it's okay. about on par with what we yeah, said. That's exactly. good. Yeah. All right. um, oh, I forgot that dude picks up the weapon, Marcus's weapon, and they talk about it. And yeah, I think that's cool that they keep mm-hmm. mentioning the weapon. I love okay. it. <laughs> All, right. All right. One of the things that I was going to mention about is mentioned in our feedback. So I'm going to hold that off. But so Karen, we did get a lot of feedback, as I mentioned. Do we want to do just go racing Mars and apologize? I'll look at atonement to see if there's anything we need to pick up. How's that sound? Sure. That sounds great. Okay, good. First of all, I'm going to go with Texas on the shocks feedback for racing Mars. All right, you Farscapers, if I don't hear a My Side, Your Side reference, I will be sorely disappointed. Yeah, we didn't do that. Oh, that's terrible. My Side, yeah. Your Side, My Side, Your yeah. Side. That was a great character on Far Side. Sorry about that, Texas. But now we mentioned it. Yeah. So what do you do when you fi- suddenly find yourself with a whole bunch of free time? Some people use it to wind down, burn off some stress, and others just go find themselves some trouble. Hey, you know what? That kind of happens to both storylines because we see Marcus and Franklin doing I Spy when they're trying to kill time. And then we see Sheridan channel surfing. I like that he was going to watch sports too, which is funny. Yes. Last time he was ordered to take some time off, he went and spent several hours venting his frustration on some poor hapless baseballs. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This time in a clear illustration of the idle hands added, she goes and starts riling up Garibaldi. This goes about as well as expected Garibaldi getting defensive and contrary and Sheridan losing his temper right there in public. This only serves to reinforce what Garibaldi already believes. And so when people come asking if he's willing to possibly work against Sheridan, he's open to it. In the meantime, Stephen and Marcus have a fun little adventure making contact with the Mars Resistance. They meet a new friend who then tries to kill them, only for it to turn out he was being controlled by an alien the entire time. What is this, Doctor Who? (laughs) The Keeper's presence does have some interesting ramifications, such as how far have they infiltrated and what exactly is their interest in Mars and or the Resistance? Yeah, I, I brought that up. What is their deal? And finally, Ivanova, MVP of the episode, in my opinion, she forces Sheridan to take some downtime because he needs it and then manages to secure a means to acquire the resources they need to keep the station running. And when reason doesn't get through to them, she's more than willing to pull the be a shame if something were to happen to your ships move, which I appreciate. It's speaking to them in their own language. Incidentally, this is the episode that inspired my moniker. Marcus, I'm a ranger. Number two is that you're a long way from Texas, son. And that (laughs) ain't the right accent. Oh, that's where he got Texas on the shock. That's great. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Uh, and he does mention a little bit about Sheridan and Delenn. Anyway, next time, be sure to mention nice outfit, Ivanova, and then you can go on a tear. Okay. okay. I love it. This is the Texas on the shock signing off. And so Zaveni in Valen's name. Good. And then we got one from Nathan. Hi, Nathan. Uh, The most interesting part of this episode for me has nothing to do with Garibaldi, but at least I know Lou is enjoying seeing him. (laughs) Captain Jack is the goat of this episode. Such a shame he's only a one episode guest star because Donovan Scott blows out of the water both resistance and goons that approach Garibaldi. But alas, this is the destiny of kooky character actors. I guess kooky starts with K. The hell is wrong with you, English people. Choose a lane. (laughs) <laughs> whole sex ceremony also came off as strange to me i know that strange sex is a low-hanging fruit <laughs> okay that's funny but the more the show went the more strange and awkward jms came off to be in that regard pleasure threshold ivanova an ambassador can chuckle at it but woohoo just kills me such a writerly thing that's impossible to do as a real dialogue hello george lucas <laughs> with regards nathan good and then david sent us a quick note which he literally says at the beginning a quick note about this a week or two ago i mentioned beef how b5 rarely gets credit for predicting the future here is possibly a couple of the most interesting things that b5 has predicted the future one as a plot point and one as a throwaway line 
Marcus and Franklin are by this point pretty tired of each other's company as witnessed by the I Spy game. So it was somewhat aggravating for Franklin to only find out they were posing as a married couple on their honeymoon. Not because it was a gay marriage, but more because it was to Marcus. Marcus, on the other hand, jumps right in, apparently enthusiastic about it. The throwaway line, that's not the Pope, doesn't look anything like her, interestingly enough, got more reaction to JMS than the gay marriage part back in the day. While we haven't seen a female Pope, the more liberal takes on Catholicism recently make it more likely, in my opinion. For next week, we discover that the old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, is not necessarily true. God, I love those. Yeah, I do too, and I love the Pope line. So real quickly, and like I said, I want to apologize to Texas, David, and Nathan that we missed last week. So here are highlights from some of the things they said about Atonement. Texas, when Gray 17 got to this episode, there was quite a lot of discussion as to how much responsibility Delenn bears for the war. There are arguments back and forth. She made the decision on her own. There were four others who also voted that way, et cetera, et cetera. Personally, I think she was voting for retaliation, not a full-scale war. Others than this, others than this, and it became something else. This makes an interesting parallel to Londo. Both made rash decisions with about full consideration, only to have them grow beyond their ability to control. I thought that was a really excellent, as your points always are, Texas. And both Lou and Karen and I will read the full-scale email, Mm -hmm. and thank you for that. David said, in the words of the late Paul Harvey, and now the rest of the story, by the way, one of my favorite things in radio ever, I ever, you can go and find some of those on the internet, and I will go through spells listening to them. I had both of the Paul Harvey books that had the stories about that, so I love this. That is an OG reference for sure. Yeah. This opens with several vignettes. Vignettes, Zach being fitted with a Babylon 5 uniform, Shakar getting a prosthetic eye, etc. One fun fact, and I did not know this, the Mambari seamstress seen here were the actual costumers on the show, and they obviously had fun with it. Oh, that's uh, awesome. I did not know that, and I love that. Thank you, David. And he asked, how will Jakar use his eye when he's not actually wearing it? And we also asked that question. And then Nathan, finally, this episode is the epitome of what Babylon 5 makes so special to me. Even though it was improvised, JMS gave a different answer to the question if Valen had children after the war. It's done with a predetermined structure of evenly paced development story with a great attention to detail and a continuation of something very important to characters and the bigger myth arc. Most of the shows, even if they are serialized, almost always lack some of these components. They are either run like rudderless ships, not knowing its destination while trying to prolong its run into infinity and overstay their welcome like Lost, or reset every season like Shameless, or have a story for just a season with new stories, the next one like Modern Treks or whatever is in every episode without care for continuity. Yeah, Nathan, I agree. I think that's a really one of the things you've said that well is the reason why Babylon 5 is so special to me. And similar to Farscape, as you rewatch the seasons more and you see the threads that are connecting things. So good. Yeah, I love that there's an overall arc as well as an arc for each season. Yeah. Many, many arcs within each season. I just, I love it. Good. And Lou, is there any feedback on the YouTube cha- channel? Yeah, we got a couple of comments for Atonement. Nathan's been busy there as well. Fans have counted possible descendants. It's from three to eight million for a person who lived a thousand years ago. So it's possible that none other were ever members of the council or possibly they were afraid of following Velen himself. So Delin's family might have avoided council as much as they could, fearing the same persecution, which is why his council never saw triluminary reacting the same way and causing its members to be astonished and he also mentions that he wrote an email last week so yeah. <laughs> he just he just yeah. acknowledged that ff fsm dog says the big lie was from Goebbels. do you need to read becoming superman jms his bio even after you finished babylon after you finished babylon 5 though for the relevance of this and i i'm familiar with the big lie there's been so many co-optings of the big line now that it, I guess it's becoming blurred. 
But yeah, there's uh, that's definitely a reference that I'm familiar with without having to read GMS's bio. But uh, Jesse, you might have some more to say on that since you've read that. Yeah, I I love it. his bio is you can divide it into two parts. The first part is his childhood, and he had a very rough childhood, and it is very depressing. And then the second half of the book, he gets into as he started writing for television and he covers everything from the real Ghostbusters to how a murder she wrote, Babylon 5, Crusade, everything he does. And one of the things that I think is interesting with him Mm -hmm. is he tends to go through and, okay, I've done really all I want to do in animated cartoons. So now I'm going to go to script writing. And now then I've done everything I want to do with TVs. So now I'm going to try to write movies and I've done everything I want to do with comics. Now I'm going to try. And he said that he would be more successful if he would stay in one genre, but instead he keeps having this desire. And he talks about that. I've got, what is the next hill? What is the next thing? And one of the things he is currently doing is he is spending a lot of time trying to preserve or bring back Harlan Ellison's legacy. He has a lot of Harlan Ellison's books had been out of print. And so he has been negotiating that they're going to reprint Dangerous Visions. They're going to do the best of Harlan Ellison collections of short stories All those are going to be new publications that are out and that he said that just it felt important to him to spend a lot of time trying to rebring Harlan's legacy back to a generation that perhaps may not have known it. So one of my favorite writers, Harlan Ellison. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And yeah, there is if you go to wherever you order books, they are available like I tend to be an Amazon guy. But there are, you can, there is new available where, yeah, Greatest Hits available March 26th, Dangerous Visions March 26th, and then these are brand new editions that I think are going to be really well done. That's cool. One thing I will say, if you're looking for those books before then, or any book that's out of print, please patronize your local used bookstore. Yeah, because they're really hurting any kind of local bookstore. Yeah, like here near Atlanta, there's a town called Alpharetta, Georgia, and Marietta. Both of them, they have a lot of bookstores, and so we, whenever we go out that direction, we stop in. I just I love browsing those, and I have found some Harlan Ellison books in those Piers Anthony Harlan Ellison. I found an old Neil Gaiman book. I have it, but I found the one where he interviews, oh gosh, what's his name? The Hitchhiker's Guide. Oh. God. Why am I not remembering his name? Like, yeah, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, yeah, but he inter- it's Neil's, he hates that book. He hates that he wrote that book. He did it for money. Mm-hmm. And I think it's funny. I found it at a used bookstore, but I just want to put a plug in there. Get the new ones by all means. But yeah, no, if you're looking that's... for the originals, go to a used bookstore. Yeah, great idea. Good. Anything else? I'm good. Nope, that's it. All right. All right. So, Lou, if someone wants to give us feedback, how can they reach you? They can, of course, come to the YouTube channel, Lou's Reviews, where you'll find the hosting of our Babylon 5 episode of reviews, along with our JKL Media podcast, where we do one-offs, and we're currently working our way through The Watchmen, having a blast with that uh, TV series from 2019. We've also done uh, other one-offs like Devs, Station Eleven, uh, The English, and a lot of great series there. And it's a little bit of a, a shame that we don't get more listeners to those because obviously they don't have the those series don't have the same footprint as like a Babylon Five series. But it's okay. We're having a blast doing them, and it's just a great excuse for us to watch some great stuff together and then talk about it. But I highly re- recommend if you have the time to check those out because there's series there that you might not have heard of that are definitely worth catching. Uh, as well as uh, we occasionally do book and movie reviews, music too. And uh, along with that, I have my writer's interviews and my Stephen King podcast. And on Twitter, you can find me at Lou W. Sitsma, S-Y-T-S-M-A. All right. And Karen? 
I'm at Elevaria on the various social medias. I am thinking about featuring my cat, which is right there, <laughs> on my TikTok channel. You might see some of that. Chunky Chuck. Nice. <laughs> what I'm going to call him. I'm pointing at him for those of you, if you want to put it in your mind. He's in back of me right now. Um, so yeah, at Elevaria there, there is a link in my bio to my link tree, which has another link to my blog, which is alleystuff.com. Yes, and I am at Jesse Jackson DFW on Twitter and slowly learning the other social networks, Blue Sky and the others. Still trying to, yeah, trying to post. Yeah, <laughs> trying, yeah, trying to figure that out. For now, I you can continue to hear me on Set Lusting Bruce, Next Stop Everywhere. Perfectly good podcast. Would love for you guys to reach over and visit with that. We are running a contest on Perfectly Good Podcast. I'm sorry, on, yeah, Perfectly Good Podcast, the John Hyatt Podcast. The guy, Michael Elliott, wrote a biography of John Hyatt, Have a Little Faith, a John Hyatt story, and he donated two autographed books for us to give away. So we are giving that to anyone who puts a review or shares a link to the podcast and says, hey, please check out this podcast. Your name goes a hat, and we're going to give two of those, give away to two people a autographed copy of John of the bio. Do, bio do you have a deadline for that? Just so uh, we put it in the end of March. So yeah, 2024. Yeah, yeah, 2024. Yes. Okay, cool. So Yeah, thank you. Good question. All right. Thank you guys for listening. We will be back next week to talk mm-hmm. another episode. And I agree with Lou. If you're not checking the one-off episodes, first off, if you've watched Watchmen, I think you know how good of a series it is. And it's really interesting to hear Lou and Karen from a newbie perspective talking about it. And if you've never watched Watchmen, go to Max, watch them, and then listen to our episode. I think you'll I think you will feel a, a little bit of extra fun hearing us discuss it for now. Be Who safe. just made me yawn? <laughs> Be kind. Sorry. That's okay. And we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Bye. Yay. All right. Nancy. <sighs>